Thumbs up? Okay, cool. A few great presenters today going on. So our first one that's gonna go up is Lucy Mogambi. Uh, a little bit about her. So Lucy is currently a PhD student in arts and visual culture at uh, visual culture education at U of A. She holds a Bachelor of Education in Ken from Kenyatta, Kenya, and an MA in Art Education from the University of British Columbia in Canada. Lucy is an artist, teacher, researcher, interested in the use of arts as a way to reach out to the marginalized groups in the Kenyan community. Her research focuses on the intersection between the arts and children with disabilities in the Kenyan primary schools. All right, so without further ado, Lucy, if you wanna share your screen and go ahead and get started. Thank you. Let me do that in a minute. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, All right. You cannot see my screen, right? Yes. Good. So today I'm talking about uh, demystifying disability through creative art making as children with disabilities um, join together and collaborate in the Kenyan primary schools. Uh, to give a brief background of this uh, project that I'm talking about, uh, is that although the Kenyan government is trying to make um, efforts towards uh, inclusion in schools, um, the, the children with disabilities are still very marginalized in the Kenyan community. So um, I have been trying to work to close the barrier between the disabled children and the regular children in the primary schools, and particularly in Eastern province where I have been uh, a teacher. So I grew up uh, in the city of Nairobi. Um, that is the main uh, city. And uh, I studied there in the city from elementary school to college. But once I completed, I got a job in the rural area of Eastern part of Kenya. And then when I went there, I discovered that um, the schools in the city are very different from those in the rural areas, and uh, it was it's unfortunate that the infrastructure in the schools in the rural areas is very bad. The classes are overcrowded. There's literally no space for children to move around, um, and of course, there's very little or no funding from the government to improve the situation. So there's a very high teacher-student uh, ratio. So a teacher can handle like up to even 50 children in the same classroom. And there's limited um, special education teacher personnel. And now the children with disability, they are then have a big problem because um, there's nobody really, really to take care of them. So as I was working in Eastern province for a long time, I kept visiting schools because I was teaching in a teacher's college and we were required to visit different primary schools. And I discovered that these children are really lonely because they don't get a chance to interact with the rest of the children. And I started thinking how I could try and put the two groups of children together, the regular children and those that have disability. And that's the time I started thinking about this project and I had two main objectives. I, I wanted to find out the perspectives of uh, the children as they work together in creative art activities. And I also wanted to find out how this process could inform my art teaching and research uh, practice. So as I did that, um, because I want to, to do this for my dissertation, I, I started doing uh, a pilot study. And of course I had to go through the IRB process. That was a very long process. Uh, I needed 
because I'm here in the US, I needed to contact people uh, in Kenya, the education office, um, the parents, the, the children themselves, the teachers, uh, the administrators, and then I also required to make a curriculum for this process so that uh, we could know how to go about uh, the, the workshops with the children. So this I did, but I got another challenge whereby I required funding and how was I to get that funding? Uh, so I started looking for ways and means of getting funding and I wrote a few proposals, uh, some of which uh, I did not succeed with. And, uh, but finally, I was able to get a, a small grant from GPSC uh, of about $1,500. And I was able to buy the materials that uh, we could start the project with. But I, I started, because it's a pilot study, I decided to start small. So I had 16 children with disability and uh, I mean, uh, a total of 16 children, but uh, uh, eight with disability and eight without disability. So I was able to buy musical instruments and uh, art supplies and uh, we made some t-shirts uh, to identify these children as they worked and uh, some materials for craft. But I also asked uh, the children to look for locally available materials to uh, subsidize the cost. So the next handle was to look for people that I could work with in, um, in the region because I'm here. So I needed human resource. And I identified two teachers, uh, that is Nicholas and Joyce. Uh, Joyce identifies herself as a person with disability because she has albinism. And uh, they were very good fit because they, 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 they agreed to work with these children. So we agreed because the classes are already overcrowded. We agreed that we were going to work outside um, the classroom, not inside the classroom. So we identified um, a school, a public school. Uh, the administrators allowed us to use that place and we agreed to use um, that space outside where the children could come together and interact and do the art activities uh, together. So the curriculum involved doing um, various types of artworks that is uh, drawing, painting, uh, mosaic collages, and uh, they could work either in groups or individually, but uh, the idea was for them to interact as uh, they, they worked together. So they also did some craft works. Um, and this involved uh, using locally available materials and recycled materials to come up with uh, some type of crafts. And some of the things that they made were floor mats and wall hangings. Uh, as you can see, they are working together, joining hands together and working uh, together. They were also able to make uh, some beadwork uh, where they made functional earrings, necklaces, and bangles that are really very beautiful. Um, and the children with disabilities uh, were also doing a really great job. Nicholas, one of the teachers, um, is a music teacher. So he agreed to teach the children um, various uh, songs and dance moves and um, singing games and they all came together and this was actually uh, kind of the main part of that workshop because the children really enjoyed. So they continued working together and as they worked together, one thing that was evident was that uh, there were times of uh, flow. What is the Miyaki cause? Um, um, the, the, the flow, you know, where people get so engaged into doing something until they forget uh, the sense of time. That happened a lot during this workshop, workshop that, which means that the children really enjoyed doing uh, what they were doing. And uh, sometimes they didn't even want to stop. They had to be told that time is up and yeah, we 
enjoyed seeing that. So uh, the works that they produced, though they are still uh, continuing with that work because it's not complete and I hope that I can uh, increase the number of students uh, as I move towards uh, my dissertation. So the works they produced were really good works. And uh, what we discovered is that disability is not inability. Uh, the children with the disability can do as good as those with abilities, just that they don't have uh, the, the facilities and they don't have uh, the chances to, to be allowed to do so. So the works that they have produced, uh, we have agreed that we are going to hold an exhibition. And once uh, the exhibition is set up, we have also agreed that the works can be sold and the money that comes from those works, then we can use it um, to continue with this project and make it even bigger so that we don't keep uh, looking for funding. So uh, we, we are putting the works together as they continue making the works. Um, I'm glad that uh, we are gaining a lot of support from the school administrators and the parents. They are all in it and uh, they, they are supporting this uh, project. Uh, to conclude, I would say that uh, I am an artist, a researcher, a teacher without disability, but uh, I am interested in art-based uh, research and I'm also uh, devoted and uh, very committed in working with children with disabilities. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Lucy. That was great. All right. At this time, we have a few moments for questions. If anyone has any Um, I actually have a question that I was curious about, Lucy. Yes. Oh, also Kylie put one in the chat. But I was wondering if you think that this is something that exists um, only in sort of workshops, like short term, or if you think that it could be implemented into other Kenyan primary schools, or if you feel like it would be a completely different entity in its own school. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you for that good question. Um, my idea is that um, in future, I would like to see a, a place where the children with disability work together with those without disability. So um, I, I would want to see see this project rolling over to all the schools in Kenya, whereby the children are actually working together. So that's why I've started uh, from Eastern province, province. I'm working with children from two different schools, but, uh, but uh, the location is in one school. So I'm just thinking that if the, I could incorporate more children with time, then uh, this can roll over into the schools and then it would just have to be part of the school program instead of being separate. I don't know whether uh, that answers the question. Yeah, it definitely does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Kylie asked in the chat, where did you get the funding again for your supplies? So from GPSC, a uh, small grant. I applied for that. I applied also from the School of Fine Art, but unfortunately uh, I got the funding from the School of Fine Art, but I couldn't get the real <laughs> money. They said that I would have to buy the supplies from here. Somebody would have to buy for me the supplies from here and then ship them to Kenya, which was not, uh, which was not viable, it was not workable. So I decided to leave that alone. Otherwise I got uh, 15, um, hundred dollars from GPSC. I, I just, I wrote a proposal and, and, and submit, submitted it. Awesome. And Carissa asked, could you talk a bit more about the ways that you observed that the participants were in the flow of the experience? Oh, yeah. So um, 
when the children were doing the, the, the work that they were doing, um, the, the workshops, uh, or rather the curriculum that I, I made was such that uh, they, they do the work in small, uh, in small portions, not too long because they can't uh, concentrate for a long time. So uh, they would do like 20 minutes break, 20 minutes break, 20 minutes break. So, so uh, what we discovered is that after the 20 minutes of working, they would not want to stop because they are so much engrossed into the work that they were doing. Uh, and they, they would kind of not want to, to, to leave it, you know? So there was that sense of concentration that came in. Uh, that's why I was talking about um, uh, the state of flow by CCMEI. Perfect. Okay, I think we're gonna move on to Rachel now. Thank you so much, Lucy, for that presentation, um, just to keep in time's sake. Yes, <laughs> Marco. <laughs> um, awesome. So Rachel, if you have slides or anything that you need to pull up, you can go ahead and do that while I'm reading through your bio. Will do. Awesome. So our next presenter is Rachel Zoll Zollinger. Um, oops, I lost my thing. Let me redid that. One second. All right. Uh, she's an interdisciplinary artist, educator, and PhD student in the arts and visual culture education at the U of University of Arizona. She's worked extensively in community spaces, museums, and other informal learning sites, developing and facilitating STEAM curriculum and environmental education programming. Her research focuses on multidisciplinary approaches to ecological literacy and agency through art and science. All right, we can go ahead and get started. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so picture this. It's a bright summer day and under the hot sun, a small piece of popcorn advances over an expanse of concrete. Nearby, other pieces of popcorn begin to progress steadily in the same direction. Above, an audience has gathered. Three children breathlessly watch this extraordinary popcorn migration, curious how someone's lunch has taken on its own locomotion. Oh, it's ants, one child exclaims. And excitedly, the children draw closer to pick, peek at the tiny insects performing gravity-defying feats beneath the relatively enormous popcorn. Suddenly, the ants have transformed from mundane background to dramatic intrigue teeming with wonder. It's midweek of a summer science camp at a working farm, the collaborative effort of a family-centered science museum and an agricultural community, hoping to engage the next generation. I'm employed by the museum as the educator for this program for elementary age students, but I prefer to see myself as just one of many participants in the multi-species conversations happening here. The topics at hand are not just about generating interest for farming, food production, and STEM career pathways. We are raising questions about how interactions with animals and plants within our immediate and everyday worlds heighten our capacities for wonder, imagination, and empathy. How might a chance encounter with ants help us connect to deeper and wider ways of learning and living? I'm interested in the ways that we, and particularly children, engage with the living world and how two powerful influences, science and art, help shape our experiences and cultivate our agency. These influences converge under the broad umbrella of environmental education, or the process of understanding natural environments and developing critical skills to address environmental challenges. A tandem approach to ecological literacy through art and science offers richer, deeper understandings as children are asked to question, interpret, and respond to their surroundings in multiple diverse ways. Though we continue to learn throughout our lives, the experiences we have in childhood stay with us and very likely frame how we see the world. Real life interspecies inter encounters with plants and animals are inherently pedagogical and shift the locus of agency from human to more than human. Earthy corporeal interactions with caterpillars and cottonwood trees make the antics, labors, and wisdoms of non-human persons hard to ignore. Learning with plants and animals makes real the non-human beings whose lives intersect with our own just as ours do with theirs. 
A dual lens of art and science helps us to look closer at our entwined relationships at the, and the unique individuals that make them, and together reveal a world more beautiful, more complex than either approach could separately show us. Science helps us make sense of the phenomena around us through empirical observation and logic, providing knowledge of this wondrous universe. But what we do with this knowledge is inflected by our co collective values and beliefs, the notions that add to what we call culture. Art helps us communicate and translate culture. In its myriad forms, art gives qualitative meaning to the world. It can teach us the value of things. While science can reveal to us the interspecies networks of trees and fungi, the quantum entanglement to navigation of birds, and the dynamic nested symbiosis of lichen, art can convey what it feels like to live among, among such marvelous things and what it means to be part of a world more intricate and connected than we can comprehend. We need hard science to record data on the uptick of temperatures, raging wildfires, and rising seas. And we need music, dance, and visual art to articulate the joy, love, awe, and grief of living in this precarious world. At the beginning of each camp day, we start with the seeding question. What is soil made of? Why do plants have flowers? What makes a habitat? We follow threads of ideas through explorations that required us to get dirt under our fingernails and friendly with the winged, tailed, footed, and rooted beings that carry out their lives in the semi-urban space. We parrot them through magnifying lenses and microscopes. We read picture books about them and we make up our own stories. We mimic their movements with our bodies and replicate them in sculpture and engineering. In the children's shared discoveries and creative projects, I look for evidence of budding multi-species relationships for moments when plants and animals shift from being the environment to fellow teachers. One child notes in their observational drawing that bees are not just black and yellow, this one is brown, black, and yellow, and this other one is yellow and gray. Another child is surprised when, after poking about in an irrigation ditch with a stick, a pale colored crawfish materializes in the dark still water, irate, and claws waving. Through these investigations and close encounters, we're discovering that there are many ways to look at and be in the world. What a beetle does and needs is different from a moth, different from a tree, and different from a human. Learning to recognize and love difference is crucial in this moment when attention to only our needs and ways of doing has brought us to the brink of ecological and social catastrophe. Learning more about the ways that other organisms move about the world opens up the ways we might imagine intelligence, care, and kinship. As we try to emulate the intricate architecture of a spider's web with string and tape, we must also consider the spider's knowledge and its relationship with the place where it has made its home. Equally important as reflecting on difference is nurturing imagination. Imagination is a space of possibility and its role is integral to both art and science. Tapping into this limitless territory where dreaming and creativity germinate is how we make unusual connections between knowledge and experience. It's where we instigate the not yet and unfold the yet to come, where we challenge the seemingly impossible. Maxine Green suggested imagination is an act of consciousness, part of what awakens us to a world in need of transformation. Imagination is fed by experiences and thrives alongside curiosity, asking not just why and how, but what could be. As we spin wild stories about our adventures with strawberries and snails, we are opening up possibilities to consider how we are all grounded by this land and everyone who lives within it. We are connecting new stories to the very old ones that persist despite our deteriorated recognition of their existence. Experience and place are active in shaping forces of imagination. And here on this farm crawling and blooming with life, we easily shape shift into bird, lizard, and leaf. We flip our human skins for others finned or feathered, trade our warm blooded mammalian matter for glistening chloroplast and cellulose. We practice living as something other than ourselves, trying to imagine the world from another's point of view. Sometimes trans-species imagining is awkward and difficult. As long ago, our thought patterns fell into narrow anthropocentric practices made for a single species world, patterns and practices that fail us all in a time of climate disruption and social unrest. Clumsy as we are, it's not so important that we truly transcend to an earthworm's worldview or fully understand its ecological significance or viscerally imagine the vulnerability and power of a squirming invertebrate body, but it is crucial that we simply try. The effort of trying generates questions beyond our human sensibilities, 
about how the world is experienced by the more than human and calls us not just to think, but to act according to our multi-species knowledge. As earthworms wriggle in our hands and disappear under rich dark soil, we glimpse the not so hidden worlds that coexist within our world and how brilliantly our non-human kin can make and navigate them. In my experience, children today are already well aware of the deleterious effects of climate change and imminent mass species extinction. The world they are inheriting is one already diminished, but is still one made of wild, astonishing things, things worth valuing and things worth saving. The primary educational experiences we construct for children today will reverberate far into the future and undoubtedly influence the next generation of thinkers, whether they become artists or scientists or something else. Their future will be filled with difficult decisions, unanswered questions, and ethical conundrums affecting the survival of many. I'm wondering how we will teach them to critically and creatively think and respond to this heavy future. And yet, under this burden, there will still be a vibrant, incredible life. Education needs to encourage children to move with agency and purpose, and also courage and joy. Art and science remind us that there are multiple ways to perceive and understand the world, and each provides insights into the circumstances of this precipitous moment. There is no strict separation between subjective and objective, rather encouragement to consider what we might learn from using both. Rather than leave us paralyzed in the face of planetary disaster, science and art give us the tools and the knowledge to embolden and empower us. Celebrating children's joyous wonder at the extraordinary strength of ants might seem insignificant, trivial even, when we're confronted with an unraveling planet. But I see this moment as the beginnings of a multi-species relationship of considering, of recognizing and listening to the fully animate world of imagining what the world could be. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was great. Thanks. Uh, so once again, we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has any, you can unmute or put them in the chat and I can read them as well. Uh, while we're letting people do that, I am curious as to how you select the children that get to participate in this or like, is there some sort of application or is it like a specific school or? No, so it's through the museum that I've worked for. Um, and yeah, it's just, I mean, the museum has a lot of summer camps. Um, this one in particular exists um, in collaboration with um, a teaching farm. Um, and so, yeah, uh, parents just sign their kids up for, for that. I mean, there are, um, just like every other camp, there's scholarships um, and pay what you can. Um, the past two years, of course, have looked a little different with COVID. Um, so, um, you know, it's been very limited. Um, but since it's mostly an outdoor camp, that's actually made it um, easier than trying to do things in a classroom. Yeah, absolutely around how many participants do you have each cycle? Um, so because of COVID this, this past year, um, this past summer 2021, there was seven kids per the year before, it was only five. Um, but prior to that, um, there was 15 um, per age group. So K through second, there was 15. And then third through fifth, there was 15. Um, and so these are, these are week long camps. So a lot of kids take them multiple times. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's a really short amount of time <laughs> to cram all that, cram all that yeah, in. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, Kylie put a question in the chat, a couple questions. Um, did you do this over the course of COVID, which you've already said you did, but if you maybe could elaborate on that a little bit more, uh, mm -hmm. and in what ways do you think it has helped kids in the midst of the digital age? I've noticed not many kids play outside anymore, and that's why I ask. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the, the impetus behind all these, these efforts, I and mean, especially for um, the agricultural community, is how do you get kids to even care um, about growing food? Um, and, you know, I've, I've done a lot of environmental education um, initiatives, which primarily consists of just taking kids out of the classroom. Um, 
I find that there is not so much resistance from the children, it's actually their parents. Um, their parents are afraid to let their children go outside. Um, and when they encounter um, things like mosquito bites, um, they, the parents don't do very well with that. Um, but the kids, they're really, they're okay. Um, and I have found that if you just give them space to play, um, they really just, they make their own worlds. Um, I think there was a picture in my slides of the kids just digging, digging a hole. And that was the thing to do for an entire week at lunch break was just go and dig a hole under a tree. Um, so yeah, I think, I think mostly kids just need the opportunity to do so. And unfortunately, most of the way that their lives are structured is um, to not do that. Um, and I don't think that's particularly children's preferences. Um, I think that's just how adults have structured their lives. Yeah, and with increasing urbanization, I'm sure that has an effect on it as well. All right, so Christine says, you mentioned that you have kids that have participated more than once. Is there evaluation conducted on why they are repeats or those who don't come back? That's a really good question, Christine. Um, not to my knowledge that, ha that has been addressed of why certain kids come back. Um, some of it is, um, you know, parents are looking for um, childcare. Um, and so they can be, you know, stretched out over a month or so. And so if the kid particularly, you know, enjoys it, maybe they'll continue to enroll their child. Um, for the farm camps in particular, um, it seems that they, the parents um, are specifically more interested in having their children do outdoor learning. Um, you know, for all the, I think all the, the Explorers camps, um, which are science-based, um, a lot of parents are very interested in STEM education, um, but there is a difference between when you sign your kid up for rocket camp and when you sign your kid up for farm camp. Um, I, I think as far as those who don't come back, um, you know, uh, one of the really great things with um, working for an organization like a museum is you actually see a lot of kids repeatedly over the years. So maybe they'll just do one thing one summer, um, but they'll come back every summer. Um, so it's actually, um, there's a couple of kids who are actually in this camp that I got to see um, in various things, um, not just farm camps, but um, in other programs that Explora does. So we really get to watch them grow up and work in different um, environments. Um, and so, and Christine, knowing um, a little bit of your background too, of there are um, certain audiences that museums uh, engage with and some, some are more inclined to certain things um, and some just don't. Um, but there's also very much like um, intergenerational interest. Um, so if one kid likes it, um, it's, chances are the brother and sister are gonna do, are gonna do it as well. Awesome. So Lucy left you a comment in the chat as well. said, I agree with you, Rachel, that we need to allow kids to freely re interact with non-human actors in the world. Absolutely. Yes. I second that. <laughs> um, and then Kylie says, this is only a summer camp. Have you considered organizing it in other seasons? So yes. Um, <laughs> and that's actually what um, we've been able to do this, this past year, which um, getting a, a big uh, grant from um, the Institute of Museum and Library Services um, in 2020. We had to rethink a lot of things um, because we couldn't um, meet in person. Um, but uh, yeah, things have definitely grown to do year round stuff like, um, again, at this, this particular working farm, we actually got a big grant to um, work with a charter school and their garden um, over the next two years. Um, which is really great because, um, like I said, the farm camps, when they're only a week long, I mean, that's not even time for a seed to sprout. Um, and so being able to do things over a semester and, or a year or even two years, um, I'm really excited about the possibilities of really establishing a culture um, rather than kind of an isolated experience. Um, because the, I think the... Um, 
concern is that it, it only is an experience and a memory rather than um, a way of, of learning through, throughout your life. Um, if, if there's nothing else beyond that one experience to support that. Yeah. It seems like it makes a lasting impact though. If you have repeat, so. repeat students participating and such. Yeah, I, I certainly hope so. Um, and sometimes they, these kids, they blow my mind with the insights that they, they are able to come up with. Like they just realize um, that I, I don't see it um, initially. Um, so it, it gives me, it gives me a lot of hope. Awesome. So we have a few more minutes. We're going to end around 945. But if we had any other questions for Lucy that um, you didn't get to ask at the beginning or Rachel as well, just want to reopen that channel because it's been a minute since Lucy's um, presentation and maybe you had time to digest that and think about things you want to ask. I want to ask Lucy a question, um, and then I've got to actually get going to get prepped up for my next session, but um, this is kind of related between the two, and I think that when Lucy, you mentioned uh, the flow that uh, your participants were experiencing, um, I want to know if you think that it was really helpful for the participants in your study to be outside and, you know, outside of a classroom. And I think about this all the time, you know, um, even in regards to um, uh, pedagogy and learning um, that don't necessarily have anything to do with the environment, but just being in a different environment that's not a classroom. Um, do you think that, um, uh, do you think that you'll continue to practice it in that regard and try to stay out of the classroom? Yeah, that's a really good question, Mago. Um, when you are beginning to do the activities outside the classroom, we did it because we didn't have enough space and we needed the children to interact freely. But once the activities started happening and we saw the way the children were enjoying just being outside that space, I think um, that space outside there is much better than just being in a confined place because uh, I think um, being inside the classroom in a way is, uh, is quite limiting, even in your way of thinking. Uh, and and uh, just being outside, you know, uh, even having that fresh air and looking at the, the, the clouds and, and the birds and, you know, uh, it gives a different feel than just being inside. So um, in future, we still hope to do it outside. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off. So I just wanted to say thank you to both of the speakers so much. And then, um, yeah, I'll give the floor to anyone who wants to uh, ask any other questions. And Katie, thank you so much for moderating. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> Bye, Margo. All right, so there's a few comments in the chat. Ryan says, thank you, kids will love your research. I hope that you will work on this research more frequently after the pandemic. Um, and then Kylie says, growing up, my parents took my brother and I camping very often. And I think because of that, I appreciate nature even more. Do you think maybe we should encourage parents to get out as a family and learn together that it might help them break that structure that many parents have of staying inside? Absolutely. <laughs> um, the the, the two-year grant that I was talking about with the charter school, part of that is um, doing field trips once a month to different farms in the area, different locations in the area that's with the families. Um, and it's something that we had tried to propose a couple of years ago that actually wasn't very well received from funders, um, which is really surprising to me that, um, you know, families are a big part of education. Um, but yeah, like parents need to feel comfortable in these spaces too. And you can definitely tell, um, the kids whose parents have, 
you know, encourage them to be outdoors and are comfortable outdoors themselves um, because the kids are fearless. Um, and it definitely reflects back. Um, so yes, I think having more opportunities for parents and families to engage together um, in spaces and learn together is, is a really big part of this, absolutely. Thank you, Kylie. All right, perfect. So we have about two more minutes. Okay, Cindy just says, read Kylie's comment. There is still the program that gives every fourth grader a national parks pass for free. Every kid outdoors is a great program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think the only downfall with some of that is that you have to get to the park. Um, and that can be a real barrier. Um, and not to say that there's anything, um, I don't wanna knock on that program at all. I think it's really great um, and can be really transformative. Um, I think it's also, there are so many amazing things that exist um, right here <laughs> in your backyard or maybe even the walls of your house um, that um, are these really incredible opportunities to learn about the, the more than human. Um, and I'm really interested in encouraging that the kind of everyday, um, ecologies, the ones that we live with every day, and finding wonder in that, rather than, you know, kind of a sacred designated space. Great. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're about at time. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Thank you to our two lovely presenters. You did a great job. And I know I personally learned a lot from both of these presentations. Uh, Carissa echo echoes that in the chat. So yay, everyone's thinking. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Katie. Uh, yeah, of course, of course. All right. Well, um, I think you have a nice break before the next couple of sessions get on, but feel free to take advantage of that. <laughs> See y'all later. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>